A new season of Marvel Snap is upon us. Let's take a look at the best spotlight caches to open in the War for the Nine Realms season in Marvel Snap. The first spotlight cache of the season features the card Frigga, a 3-3 with the ability to copy the card you played before it. Now, Frigga is particularly interesting because I suspect she's going to be relatively overshadowed by the release of Surtur, a card that is on the season pass releasing the same first week of the season and is a dangerous, dangerous card with wild metagame implications, a card with a lot of power pumped into it that is meant to boost a specific archetype. Frigga is a little bit harder to figure out, and for that reason, I think it's possible she ends up maybe a little bit underrated. That said, when I actually get down to brass tacks and try to figure out what specifically I'm doing with Frigga, there's only really one word that comes to mind, and that word is green. Whether the power number becomes green or the energy number becomes green, what Frigga wants the most is to be copying things that are either, that are bigger than they should be for how much they cost. And there are two real ways to make that happen. The first is to play a card that wants to grow, a card like Sage that gets bigger and bigger, a card like Deadpool, a card like Venom. Those cards, when copied, keep their green power. So that is a way of taking a card with a relatively low power and making it bigger, which makes Frigga more effective. The other way to go is to copy something that has a discount attached to it. That could be a card like Mockingbird or Scar or maybe even something along the lines of Sasquatch. And that will then allow the card to be played again and you get the similar effect of playing a very large card for not a large amount of energy. Those are the things that Frigga really wants to do. What I worry is, in practice, there might not be a specific home for her. This is a card that feels fairly generically strong, a card that I am interested in trying in various situations, but I need to see something specific before I really start believing. It's gonna be a while before I actually feel like I know what this card is doing most of the time, but once I see it make like one or two real power plays that justify its inclusion in decks, and that's a really important point, by the way, we'll circle back to that, but justifying your inclusion in decks is more than just it is good some of the time, it has to be good than better even than what you'd replace to get it in there. Now, once I see that happen a couple times, once I see it justify its existence, I think that's the kind of thing that can really change my mind. Once I see an in practice, this card actually doing something consistently good in a consistent way that is better than another card that you would actually be playing in that spot, then I'll change my mind on this card. But for now, my instinct is to stay away until someone proves that it can hang at the high level. And when I say proves, I don't just mean someone is doing well with a good deck that took out a card and put this in there. 11 of 12 is just the good deck. I mean, it is an actual upgrade over the other card you would be running. This is really important to understand. The concept of value over replacement comes up a lot, and I'd like to dive into it just a little bit in the context of Frigga here. You need to find a deck to justify purchasing this card at the prices they put on these cards. You need to find a deck that actually needs her. The way Anti-Venom decks actually needed Anti-Venom. Those decks had Luke Cage packages that actually needed Anti-Venom in order to succeed. We had that, those decks for Anti-Venom. I don't know if those decks exist for Frigga. You need to have a card. If you're going to spend 6,000 tokens or one of your precious spotlight caches chasing a card like this, it needs to be a card that justifies itself unambiguously. So my advice for you over the first week of the season is keep an eye out for decks where she is a serious, legitimate upgrade over any other card. That's what you'll need to justify pulling the trigger here. The good news for fans of Frigga is that her spotlight cache is filled with cards that are just good that you're never going to be upset to have. This is Red Guardian. He is just good. He does a lot of things that no other card at his cost will actually do, and he has often been a relevant inclusion in a variety of decks. It's actually kind of interesting to me that they included the cards that they did in this cache because I kind of feel like they overshadow Frigga a lot. Because when you look at this card in Copycat, which is the other card in the cache, you kind of see like these are like generic, standard, good cards, three drops, right? Like you're going to see 
copycat and red guardian index just on stats and efficiency and the good stuff they do and frigga kind of doesn't compare in that regard frigga is something that is much more specific much less generic and it's almost weird when i look at this i think that she is probably the third best card in the entire cache which is not really the situation you want to be in but on the other hand it does mean that if you're missing this card which is just a not necessarily a staple but pretty close to a staple where it's just like in certain metagames you're going to be really sad when you don't have this card in other metagames you're going to be fine running something else over it but you're never going to actually be upset that you uh own it you're never going to be like oh man i can't believe i wasted the tokens on red guardian he's always going to be at least a little bit playable at least in the current state of the game just a very solid 3-5 stat line that also has the ability to interact with your opponent's effects. Just very, very generally good card. Speaking of generally good, Copycat is perhaps the most generally good 3-drop in the game. A 3-5 stat line with an upside ability. There's really not much else to say about this other than in any world where people are playing a 3-drop and are interested in the 3-drop being good on curve, Copycat is one of the first choices off the board. A sort of round one draft pick of good 3-drops. She is, and this is worth noting, uh, non-specific, right? Like, this is, when you need your three drops to be doing a specific thing, she is not that. The specific thing she does is be good value for her energy almost all of the time. There are metagames where that is not particularly relevant, and you need, like, other specific things to actually, you know, interact with what your opponents are doing, like Red Guardian, for example, or in a world where Frigga is good, you can't really replace Frigga with a card like this, this is just generic good stats and information that is used in a positive way in nearly every game you play of Marvel Snap that she is involved in. One of the, I would go so far as to say she's a staple three drop, where it's just if you are looking for stats, if you are looking for the ability to play cards that are just good on curve, this is your pack one, pick one, first draft pick. She is elite at that among the threes. The next cash up has Malekith as the new card highlight. A 4-6 with an on reveal ability that goes and yanks a cheap card from your deck and puts it on the board next to Malekith face down. And it is not revealed until the end of the game. And this has two implications. And I'm interested to see which one of them will be more important for the card Malekith. Implication number one is this is like a reasonable body with really good deck thinning attached to it, right? Like you can go yank a card out of your deck and it will be on the board, and then you will no longer be able to draw that, which should, in theory, make your draws in the late game better because that card is now no longer part of them, and it's a cheap card that you probably weren't looking to draw anyway. So in a world where people are playing, you know, Wiccan decks and things like that, this is like a good kind of deck thinning four drop that will make you more likely to draw your six drops. That's probably a pretty good thing that people are interested in doing. There's also other implications to this, because this card, to me, when I look at it, it's like, oh, does this want to be a combo card? Is that what this card is trying to be? Is this card attempting to be like a, we are going to pull out our Mystique or my or our Hazmat or our Loot Cage? Because those are all like really interesting potential hits that this card could pull. And I think that that's a really interesting kind of way to design a card like this, because there are two sort of directions that this is pulling me. The first direction it's pulling me is, oh, this card wants to be a value card. It wants to be a 4-9 that I play for deck thinning, and I don't really care what I'm pulling. And the other version of it is this card wants to be pulling something specific, and because it wants to be pulling something specific... I want to be playing like a fairly limited number of low cost cards so I can always be pulling that thing. In other words, it's pulling me between like playing a generic, like just good cards mid range and playing like a hyper specific combo deck. And I think a card that has enough nuance in it that it could be conceivably in either of those lanes is actually a very interesting card to make. I'm not sure which direction it ends up going. I mean, you know me, I would lean the direction of the hyper-efficient mid-range card being where this card actually ends up landing. In a world like the Marvel Snap we had maybe three or four months ago where you could play a good four drop and it would matter a lot, like if Sandman was still around, I think this card would be unbelievably good. Where you just play this as a four, play the Sandman, and it's like a bunch of stats that probably drew you closer to your Ultron. That's the exact thing you'd want in a Sandman deck. Like, that's unbelievable. That's exactly the thing you're looking for. But we don't have that anymore. And so now the question for that version of Malekith is, what do we have to do to make a deck like that functional and good in the current metagame? 
The answer recently has been stuff like Anti-Venom and Loot Cage, things like that. And that still seems like it'd be higher value than Malekith. So the question for Malekith is, what kind of good cards mid-range deck that really benefits from this? Because I, I think that the number one effect that if this card makes it into good cards mid-range decks you're going to see is more Eliaths, more reliably. And I think that's worrying. But I also think that, like, the general deck-thinning ability that this card has alongside a good body, like, I'm not going to say it reminds me of America Chavez. She's obviously better. But it is a very interesting concept to introduce, and it's going to be kind of interesting to see exactly what it takes for that to be valuable. My instinct is we're in a bit too much of an explosive metagame right now for people to care about what this is doing. We need certain, the metagame, if the metagame were a little more mid-rangey and tradey and smaller in terms of the point packages that were available to people, then maybe this card could really shine. As is, I don't know that it will, but that deck thinning on a big body thing really is interesting to me. Alongside Malekith in the caches is Thena, and she might be the biggest draw of all of these cards in the caches because she has just been a consistent high performer. She's not a card that goes in every deck. Decks are Thena decks more than they, they are just like a copycat that goes in a bunch of different stuff. But Thena is the sort of carry of her archetype, right? Like when I say decks are Thena decks, what I mean is they're mostly unplayable without her. There are going to be a lot of decks that have Thena in them that there are no real good replacements for. Even something like Angela falls pretty dramatically short when you look at the point ceiling of this card. Thena has been an absolute all-star in basically every Agent Venom deck. Well, not every Agent Venom deck, but a lot of Agent Venom decks. And she has been an absolute stud in pretty much everything that runs Kitty Pride. She is the Kitty Pride card now. And I think that is worth pointing out. Like, if you like the play style of those decks, you will like playing Thena. You will probably want to pick her up. She is one of the biggest, highest scaling two drops in the entire game right now. And while there are other things that compete with her, that is always going to be true. She does a lot of damage right now, and I think it is worth pointing that out. Now, right now, her best decks are all Agent Venom decks. And it is also worth considering that that card is potentially on the nerf chopping block. However, I find it difficult to believe that, that any nerf to Agent Venom, I find it difficult to believe they'll also hit Thena. In other words, I expect this card to be around for a good long while. This is a dangerous and powerful card that has a lot of real upside. One thing you may want to be aware of, though, is uh, Red Guardian just got is on the caches before this one, so you might get a little bit more Red Guardian with your Thena than you would otherwise with that increase in availability of a very good tech card into this deck. Now, Thena is also a green power card, and Thena decks are all green power decks, Green power decks aren't in the most amazing spot right now because of the Shadow King change. Uh, that's sort of just how it is. But this is still a solid card that is in very good decks that if you wanted to pick up would not be a mistake. I've seen more people playing Valentina recently, and I am included in those. But I do think that it's worth pointing out that this card pretty much just is only being played because people are already playing a lot of Luke Cage. It's not a coincidence that Valentina started showing up in large numbers be when Anti-Venom came out because they're kind of doing similar stuff, and if you're building for Anti-Venom, you're already playing Loot Cage, and so you might as well build for Valentina as well because she just kind of goes in there and you're interested in having two drops. I don't want people to get it twisted. This card is far from required in basically every deck that she's been in. She's like a fine little card as a sort of additional piece of the package to include, but I don't want people to go in and look at those decks and be like, I can't play them without Valentina. You can absolutely play them without Valentina. With all due respect to this card, she is not an important or core piece of any of the decks she's in. She's cool. She's nice. There's nothing wrong with her. But she's not built like that. Given my fear of Surtur, I'm interested to see what Fenris Wolf can do. I think fairly obviously, if you Shang-Chi something and then Fenris Wolf activate that something back onto your side of the board, you're going to be in a really good spot against pretty much any Surtur deck, which does sort of encourage me as a Surtur deck builder to slap more Cosmos and Armors in there, which might in turn make this card a little less valuable. It'll be really interesting to see how that dynamic ends up playing out, honestly. 
This is a strong card, but it only does a couple of things specifically really well. The first of those things is Shang-Chi, but there are other potential applications for this card that I think are going to be more determinant of what its long-term viability is going to be. The interesting thing for me is there's a sort of pin in the way this card wants to be deck built, because if you're not hitting something with Shang-Chi, you need to be playing something else in order to make this card make sense. Unless you're just fine with playing a Shocker, there are some decks that are, right? Like we just talked about Valentina. Some decks are fine with playing a Shocker that sometimes has minimal upside, right? Like it's, that's, that's normal. But let's say you're trying to get actual value out of this card. The interesting thing is you kind of want to be playing Gladiator. Like Gladiator is a great way to get like a pretty solid card out of most Fenris Wolf hits. But in any metagame where you're really trying to Shang-Chi people, are there going to be enough targets for Gladiator? If you're out here trying to hit a deck that runs four tens, are you really seriously playing Gladiator on turn three? I don't know. Maybe you are. Well, the other interesting thing is what if Fenris Wolf does its job as a Shang-Chi deck of pushing the metagame down and people stop playing those tens? Then suddenly you really want Gladiator because you want to be able to still get value out of your Fenris Wolf. There are other potential interesting things you could do with this. I know people are going to look at like the discard part of this card and think, oh, you know, maybe that makes sense as well. I am not of the opinion that the discard part makes sense. There are a couple of major reasons for that. The first is Black Bolt hits the weakest card in your opponent's hand, the, the lowest energy, which is usually not going to be worth bringing back. And Silver Samurai hits the lowest power card. Again, not always likely to be worth bringing back. The targeted abilities that we have for the destroy side with Gladiator and Shang-Chi, I just feel like they're better than their equivalents on the discard side. And that is my fundamental worry here. Maybe you're just fine playing this as a value to drop and just getting whatever you get off of Black Bolt. Maybe that's fine. I'm not sure that it is. I might make some people angry with this one. Werewolf by Night is a fine, good card, and I have nothing against it. But right now, I would say that it is not a compelling reason to open Spotlight Caches. This is a card that when you compare it to the other stuff that I think is a compelling reason to open Spotlight Caches, you can start to understand why that is. The first thing is, Bounce decks have been moving away from this card generally, and if it's not being played in Bounce, it doesn't really have a home. And when I say moving away from this card, I don't mean that it's unplayable in Bounce. What I mean is that it's not required for Bounce, and that means that you don't have to get it for anything, really. And that's sort of a problem when you're looking to spend the amount of resources that a Spotlight Cache is. Werewolf by Night is a good card, but Spotlight Caches demand that if you're going to spend your resources on them, they have to be for great cards that you're going to use a lot. You're not going to be necessarily sad to have this card in your inventory, but it's not going to be of the level of something that could be better, right? Like, I think most of the time, if you pick up a Red Guardian or a Copycat, you're probably going to be playing those more than you're going to be playing Werewolf by Night. Again, not a bad card, perfectly acceptable, but there are like three different builds of Bounce. All of them are good, and only one of them plays this. And I think that that is indicative of the fact that you absolutely do not need this card to play hit, to play the archetype that he goes in. And if you do not need a card to play an archetype, it is hard to justify spending the amount required to pick up that card. This is a tough one because Annihilus is still kind of the only guy doing what he does. And there is something to be said for you cannot play certain decks without this card. Annihilus is a card that you will be happy to have if and when he becomes really good again, but I don't know when that will be. Annihilus has been showing up in various spots, and there's nothing wrong with playing an Annihilus deck. It's just like he's sort of, I don't know, the harbinger of tier two. Like, he's just the, the tier two god. You could probably build any random Annihilus deck and still be able to beat people with it. Like, this is not a bad card. It's just a little bit removed from the ceiling of the game right now. The ceiling of the game is much higher than what this guy can compete with. And that is, you know, there's good and bad things about that. This is a card that I think is unique enough that it might be worth picking up anyway. Because again, in a world where you are trying to play an Annihilus deck, there are no substitutes. You cannot replace anything for this card. It cannot happen. But... There are other cards like that that might be higher priority later on down the road. Cards like Ajax, for example, another There Are No Substitutes 5 drop. I do think that I would rather have Ajax than Nihilus, if that comparison helps you out any. 
And I think that Annihilus is like a unique, interesting, and powerful card that lends itself to a package that has not necessarily been part of Tier 1 decks consistently for a little bit now. I am so ready to be wrong about this guy. This is the most confusing card in the entire season for me because when I look at him, I'm like, oh, that's Red Hulk. That's Red Hulk. That's a Red Hulk. That's Red Hulk. And Red Hulk's really good. And so my instinct is that I think this card's going to be really good. Like, when I see this guy, I'm like, okay, so I play a Kitty Pride and then two arrows. That's like six. My opponent plays cards that presumably have an honor reveal. This guy's really big. This guy's just a big, 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 big guy. What I also wonder about is what if I'm Ravonaing this guy? Is that the kind of thing that I'm trying to do here? Do I want to Ravona this guy out on five? Maybe Taskmaster it? How big is he going to be? Is he going to be 11? Is he going to be 13? Is he going to be 15 or 17? Those are the kind of things that I really want to find out. How many on reveals is my opponent playing most of the time? Is this guy good in some matchups and bad in others? One of the things that I really noticed earlier about Frigga was that she kind of wants to be in a deck that plays Ravona. So you can do like this sort of sage stuff with her. That's what she wants, I think. And I kind of wonder if this is a card that is a boost to that archetype. Is there going to be some sort of Frigga, Ravona, Gore thing happening? I don't think they go together very well because Frigga Sage wants to be your turn five with a Ravona out and Gore wants to be your turn five with a Ravona out. So I don't know, but I'm really interested to see what a card like this can do with access to Ravona Renslayer. The other thing to think about with this card is pretty obviously Agent Venom, right? Like, you know, that's a plus five if you Agent Venom this guy. Pretty big. Uh, there are some things to think about there. These cards, though, especially like these giant big six drops that just say win one lane, they tend to be at their best when you are able to lock up another lane early. Like, what I mean by this is a lot of Eliath and Red Hulk and Cannonball and Blob being good was that there were things in the, in the metagame that allowed the decks that were playing these cards to lock up another game early. And I think that that is a reasonable thing to worry about with this card because there aren't many of those now. Red Hulk of those was the one that was the most generically playable. It would just go in a bunch of decks. Any deck that wanted a big six drop would play Red Hulk. It is possible that this card ends up the same, but I do think you will probably have to do a little bit more deck building work to make that happen. When I look at decks that might want this, I think Wiccan decks play kind of a lot of on reveals and are interested in doing this, but there are, there are going to be some considerations. Like, are you going to still want to play Speed, or do you want to try to play an on reveal there instead? Are you going to play Gladiator? Because then if you play Gladiator, maybe you play Fenris Wolf? Like, there's some interesting hooks that this card has, and like the minor decisions that it causes you to make in deck building. Like, what if I take out this ongoing card for an on reveal semi equivalent card? What happens then? I think that's interesting. This guy's really big. Historically, really big cards have been really good in Marvel Snap, but the fact that he's not always going to be huge, I think, does matter as well. Like, your opponent being able to play a deck that can blank this guy, ongoing decks basically blank this guy entirely, right? Or not necessarily blank them, but they leave him reliant on you, which means that a lot of the time you're playing him for, like, 11, and at that point he's basically just the Hulk, which means he might as well just be blank. And so that's kind of the interesting thing for me, is how big is this guy most of the time versus how big is this guy when you're building for him, and how big is this guy when your opponents are building against him? That's what I consider interesting about this guy. I think instinctively that he's probably going to be pretty good, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am gonna issue a very hard wait and see on Gore. Havoc is a pretty mediocre card, if we're gonna be completely honest here. Like this is a card that a couple of top players are really big fans of, just instinctively, and they really like playing it. And he's not great. He's not all that bad. I think a lot of people are going to look at him as like, oh my God, this guy's unplayable and terrible and we can't do anything about it, but it, he's okay. Like, I don't think he's worth opening for in any real sense of the word. I would not be opening caches for Havoc, and I really do think that's kind of all there is to say about him. He sees some play in various sort of like Madam Web, I guess you'd go quote unquote aggro decks, where the idea is just you play Havoc, he gets really big, you've Agent Venomed him, but it's like the fourth best thing to do with Agent Venom. And I guess if you're going to, be really invested in being the fourth best thing to do with Agent Venom. I mean, go go ahead, go off. But I don't think that's a really generalized recommendation to pick this card up. I would not be personally interested in going out and getting Havoc. 
Legion's one of those cards that you're never really going to be sad to have in your collection. You're going to be able to run him in various spots in, like, worlds where you don't necessarily have the optimal 5-drop for that situation. But I will say that this is less true of him than it was of those three drops that we talked about in the first cache. Like, it's a similar dynamic to Red Guardian and Copycat, but you play more three drops in most decks than you play five drops, so there's more competition for the five drop slot, and that makes it a lot harder to fit Legion into your decks. So while it is fair to say that you likely will not be sad to have him, I do consider it much less likely that you're going to be actively happy to have Legion than you will be to have those three drops in the first cash that we talked about. I do think that is worth pointing out here. Like Legion's a good card, but the need, the like the amount of spots you have in decks for five drops, you usually have to run something great. And there's a lot of really great five drops in the metagame right now, which make it hard for Legion to actually find himself a spot to succeed in a variety of decks after the storm nerf. He does get played in a lot of RSM decks though. All right, y'all, thank you so much for making it through that video. As always, I have been KM Best. You have been phenomenal, and I will see you in the next one. I hope you enjoyed this rundown of the things you're going to expect to see in the caches this season. As always, it's from Data Mines. I don't know if it's going to stay like this, but it has every other time, but I do feel obligated to point that out as well. And of course, I do not know of any balance changes pending to any of these cards. I do believe there is an OTA on the 14th of November. So if you're going to be looking for anything to change, that is probably when you're going to be wanting to pay attention. Thank you so much for watching. I already did my outro and then I kept talking. So I'm just going to like end the video awkwardly. <laughs>